Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the latest episode of the Free Marketeers podcast. Thanks very much for being with us on this latest episode. Today, we're going to tackle the prickly topic of healthcare. Um, it affects all of our lives in various different ways. All countries around the world have different healthcare systems, um, problems that they're dealing with, issues that they're trying to sort out, public versus private, all of that stuff we're going to delve into specifically as regards to Canada. And to help us unpack this, uh, this difficult subject um, is a guest from the Fraser Institute, but they're based in Canada. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Bacchus uh, Barua to our podcast. Bacchus, thanks very much for being here. Thank you so much for having me on the show. So as I mentioned, healthcare being a prickly topic, it's difficult for governments to figure out what to do, what, well, what not to do. All of them are tempted to do something. So we wanted to get you on to talk about your experiences in Canada and how things work there or perhaps don't work there. Lessons that you think a country such as South Africa could learn. Of course, we're at the moment looking at implementing a national health insurance that's going to monopolize the management of all healthcare services in the hands of the state. Um, but yeah, I think over to you, the platform is yours and let's see what we can learn from Canada. Yeah, um, my, my pleasure to, sh to share some of the research that we've done. Um, you know, I should mention that um, working for the Fraser Institute, the Fraser Institute is a nonpartisan and independent think tank. Um, and we do not accept um, uh, any government funding or contracted research. And we have a, a rigorous peer review process. So everything that I'm gonna be talking about is publicly available and accessible. And we try and use publicly available data as much as we can. Um, you know, I, I think it's important when any country is, is thinking about um, reforming their healthcare system um, or looking at ways to improve it. Uh, one of the things that's necessary and important to do is to look at um, other countries that have followed a similar or different path to try and understand what lessons you can learn from them, whether they are uh, lessons about um, good policy and, and what leads to, to better outcomes and, and more resources, um, as well as um, poor policy, which, you know, um, may share a stated objective or goal, uh, but is not actually meeting that objective or goal uh, when we look at it in better measures. So one of the things that, um, that I think might be helpful um, is to look at Canada's healthcare system um, and, and really, you know, talk about our example and how it compares to other countries around the world uh, within a universal healthcare uh, construct. Um, so the way that I've structured um, the, the presentation here is to really look at, at four areas. Um, the first one is the Canadian approach um, to healthcare, really just to you know, help people understand what we're actually talking about here. We, we always talk here about Canada's healthcare system um, as the poster child for universal healthcare, um, but it is only one particular way of um, achieving universal healthcare. Um, and that too, one that is actually quite unique, um, as we'll see, uh, compared to other countries around the world. Um, we're then also going to talk a little bit about how that uh, particular approach uh, stacks up on key indicators of performance compared to other countries in the OECD. Um, we'll take a little bit of an uh, in-depth approach um, to uh, look at wait times, which is probably, uh, unfortunately, um, um, Canada, Canada's healthcare system's most uh, prominent um, failure. Um, and then we'll also talk about a couple of different policy options, uh, looking at how other countries um, do universal healthcare, countries that have um, arguably superior performance on, on key indicators and what actually differentiates them uh, in comparison to Canada. So let's start by just looking at Canada's healthcare system. Um, you know, just some basic um, stats. Uh, we have uh, total healthcare spending of about uh, 2.6, uh, $265 billion. Um, the uh, per capita spending is about uh, $7,000. Um, our total share of GDP when it comes to uh, healthcare spending is 11.5% um, of GDP. Um, and of that um, $265 billion total spending, uh, the public total is about $187 billion. So what does that translate to? That translates to about 70% of public spending and about 30% of private spending. Now, there's a lot to unpack within those two, um, within those two uh, segments of the pie uh, as we'll go forward. But let's first, let's first look at that big 70% figure, um, which is the public healthcare system and, and really what's talked about um, most frequently. So when we're looking at the public healthcare system, um, essentially Canada's healthcare system aims to provide universal coverage for medically necessary services. And that's a really key term. Um, as we as we'll talk about later, because 
um, a lot of the policies that um, that um, characterize Canada's healthcare system really depend on whether a service is considered medically necessary or not. Uh, and it's not always clear um, what that case is. Um, <clears throat> it is a tax funded system um, that is uh, funded through general revenue. So there are no earmarked um, taxes for healthcare. Um, and because it's a tax funded system, that's why it's important to look at, you know, when we're looking at that um, four and a half to five thousand dollar per capita figure for public health care spending. It actually looks quite different when you look at um, how much different families are contributing. So that translates to about, you know, five thousand dollars for the average individual um, and about fourteen and a half thousand dollars for the average family. Um, and you'll see it, you know, slightly lower amount for the average single individual um, with a child and so on and so forth. Um, we also have what's often referred to as a gatekeeping system. Um, that essentially means that in order to see a specialist, you generally first have to go and um, access uh, a general practitioner in order to get a referral. Um, and unfortunately, there is little to no private options for medically necessary services within this system. Um, so the question is, why does this healthcare system, why does this you know, public portion look this way? How do we end up with these key features? Well, in order to understand that, we have to understand um, the Canada Health Act. Healthcare in Canada is actually technically a provincial responsibility. We have 10 different provinces across Canada, um, and according to the Constitution, healthcare is meant to be a provincial responsibility. Um, however, you know, I'd say there's been a bit of an evolutionary process over the last 40 or 50 years, um, beginning in about uh, the mid 1960s. Uh, some provinces, um, specifically Saskatchewan, started experimenting with the universal healthcare model that translated to several other provinces across Canada. And by 1984, um, they started to, um, uh, the, the implementation of, of the Canada Health Act uh, began between 84 and 85. Now, the CHA is, is quite an important thing to, to understand in the Canadian context because it isn't um, something that um, grants particular rights to patients. It's actually a financial act which dictates the terms and conditions under which provinces receive transfers from the federal government. These are the CHD uh, Canada Health transfers. Um, they add up to up about $40 billion, which is about 22% of, um, of provincial spending um, in a province like Alberta. It can go up to about 30%. But why is this important to talk about? Well, it's important to talk about because essentially we have a system where although healthcare is a provincial responsibility, the federal government really dictates the terms and conditions under which those provinces receive those cash transfers. And therefore, through its spending power, has a lot of um, influence over what a particular province's healthcare uh, system looks like, and importantly, what it doesn't look like. Now, in order to receive those cash transfers, um, the CHA requires those provinces to abide by certain terms and conditions. These are commonly referred to as the five principles of the Canada Health Act. Um, that is public administration. So the insurance plan of the province needs to be publicly administered. Uh, it must provide comprehensive coverage um, to um, across all insured services. It must be provided on universal terms to 100% of the population of the provinces. Um, it must be portable. So that means that when somebody goes to a different province, um, they should be uh, able to get coverage in that province. Um, typically, there's a, uh, a waiting period of no more than three months. Um, and there uh, needs to be no impediment on what's called reasonable access to care. Um, there's also what are often referred to as sections 18 through 21. Uh, these are um, uh, essentially uh, certain segments of it that are referring to extra billing and user fees, typically referred to uh, when we're talking about co-payments and user fees and things like that. Those are, those are what sections in 18, 18 through 21 are referring to, and they effectively prohibit um, extra billing and user fees in Canada. What's really interesting about the Canada Health Act, apart from the fact that it's it's really a federal, um, uh, sorry, a, a financial act, is that these five pillars are actually very vague in how they're worded. That's really important because while some might consider that to be a good thing, um, it actually leads to a very risk averse environment for provinces. Uh, essentially, most provinces in Canada actually institute legislation that goes far beyond what's required by the, the letter of the CHA, um, because at any point in time, the federal government of the day might decide that certain 
um, policies that a province is pursuing um, is, in their opinion, contravening those pillars. Um, and because it's so vaguely worded, um, that can change uh, depending on which federal government is in power at a particular point of time. Um, what's clearer, however, are those sections 18 through 21. And um, in those circumstances, essentially any reported um, co-payments or, or user fees in, in a province, um, if they are reported to the federal health minister, um, that requires the minister to claw back the same amount of um, funds um, from the CHD to those provinces. With those five other principles, however, um, if there is any contravention that is reported um, and, and, and uh, agreed upon by the federal government of the day to be contributing those principles, they can actually withhold the entirety of those funds. So that creates a lot of power for the federal government to really shape what provincial healthcare policy looks like across the provinces. Now, all of this really um, applies to what are considered medically necessary services. But actually, there is no nationally defined package. Um, they generally refer to physician services, hospital services, uh, inpatient drugs. Um, and there's a little bit of a, a gray area when it comes to things like um, lab services and diagnostic tests. But medically necessary services services don't usually cover things like cosmetic or plastic surgery. They actually don't cover outpatient drugs, um, although there are large provincial programs that separately function to provide that sort of coverage. Uh, they generally don't cover um, healthcare professionals like psychologists. And again, there's a bit of a gray area when it comes to psychiatrists, um, as well as rehabilitation and newly virtual care. Um, so where does that leave the private sector? Well. It actually leaves it in a, a very, very small pocket. Um, Canada is quite unique amongst the universal healthcare systems in that it effectively prohibits any primary or secondary uh, insurance coverage for medically necessary services. Um, and this stands in stark contrast to other universal healthcare systems like, you know, um, Australia, Germany, Switzerland, the Netherlands, um, that all have universal healthcare systems, but actually have a deep cooperation. Um, with, with private insurers to actually achieve that same universal healthcare goal. Um, meanwhile, in Canada, uh, private insurance essentially is relegated to only providing coverage for complementary services, in other words, non-medically necessary services. Uh, and as we saw above, that's, that's a, quite a comprehensive uh, package, even if it is um, ill-defined. Um, hospitals, uh, they're technically actually private not-for-profits. Um, institutions, um, but they are effectively um, public uh, organizations. And that's something that even um, organizations like the OECD now categorize all of the 708, well, sorry, 708 hospitals uh, as public organizations uh, in Canada because of how deeply integrated they are uh, and dictated by, um, by government. Um, there are about only seven private for-profit hospitals, most of which really kind of grandfathered into, um, into the current healthcare system. Um, these public hospitals uh, are, are funded via global budgets. Um, the funding is negotiated with provincial healthcare ministers. Um, there are some private for-profit clinics that provide you know, those typical um, non-medically necessary uh, services or services that are in those gray areas. Um, although over the last five or six years, there's been uh, some extent of third party um, contracting in some provinces. So provinces like uh, Saskatchewan have partnered with third party private clinics um, in order to deliver some you know, simple day surgeries and things like that that would have been under the public system. Um, and you know, the initial um, evidence from those provinces is that they managed to dramatically expand capacity and reduce their wait times through those partnerships. But again, those partnerships are severely limited in what they can do further um, by those same constraints of the Canada Health Act that we talked about earlier. Um, physicians are mostly self-employed, um, although uh, they do work and are funded um, by government funds. Um, general practitioners um, uh, receive fee-for-service, um, really a mix of fee-for-service and some capitation. Um, specialists are far more uh, fee-for-service as we can see in the, in the graph uh, on the left. Um, those fees are negotiated um, and regulated um, with uh, provincial medical associations. 
Um, and essentially, there is no um, or very little uh, dual practice. So the ability of physicians to operate in both the public and the private sector is severely limited, um, oddly enough, through provincial legislation and not directly through the Canada Health Act. And this, again, goes to the sort of risk-averse environment that's created by the CHA, um, where a lot of provinces go beyond what's required by the CHA, just in case a government comes along the way and decides that some of the dual practice might contravene uh, the Canada Health Act. Um, so essentially, this is done through, uh, you know, either direct provincial legislation or, you know, severe disincentives to opt out uh, from, uh, from the public system. So this is a really interesting graph, um, at least to me, because it really shows a very different story to that 70-30 split that we saw earlier. Um, the, the blue um, part of the pie is public and, and the red is private. And we see that that 70-30 split, when we look at just hospital spending, um, is very different. It's about 90-10, uh, 90 to public. Uh, with physician spending, it's about 98% public and 2% private. Um, and with pharmaceutical sp spending, you have a little bit of the reverse, where it's about 63% private um, and 37% public. So um, a very different story when you actually look at how that private spending is split. And the reason why um, this is the case, as you can probably guess by now, is about um, the CHA and how it defines medically necessary services. So because only inpatient drugs um, are considered medically necessary, that's why we see a larger portion of private spending <coughs> when it comes to uh, drug spending. But when it comes to hospital and physician spending, things that are very certainly within um, the, the, uh, the definition of medically necessary services, uh, private involvement is very, very minimal. Okay, so that's that's just a general understanding of, of Canada's approach to universal health care. And, and I say that because it's important for us to remember that universal health care doesn't necessarily mean exactly the way that Canada is doing things, um, as we will see going forward. Uh, when we look around the world, um, there are several other countries with universal health care, and they have a variety of different policies. Um, and I think one of the tragedies of the way that we talk about um, healthcare uh, in, in discussions is that we have this one-to-one -one black and white sort of way of talking about things. It's either you know Canada versus the United States or the United States versus Cuba or purely public and purely private. Um, and just, just as many things in the world, there's, there's a lot of myths in between. So uh, without getting in, you know, getting bogged down into uh, you know, universal versus not universal, let's actually say, okay, if, if a country does decide that it, it desires to have the social goal of having uh, a universal healthcare system, um, let's look under that umbrella at the other countries that have taken that same decision for their societies. Well, we end up with a very different comparison then. We end up with a comparison where we're looking at Canada versus 27 other countries in the OECD with universal healthcare. Um, and this, you know, as, as shocking as it might be for, for somebody um, uh, who's watching this, it actually comes oddly enough as a surprise even within Canada, where we're often sort of led to believe that the only way to achieve universal healthcare is the way that we currently do it. Uh, and we almost completely ignore the variety of other ways um, that um, that other university healthcare systems do it. And, and I often think about, I'm often reminded of um, uh, the ice cream company Baskin Robbins, which has 31 flavors, you know, and it's like, there are these, you know, all 27 other flavors of universal healthcare out there, but we're, we're adamant that vanilla is the only way to go. I, I do like vanilla though. Um, but let's look at, okay, so so we've, we've figured out what kind of the healthcare system looks like and what it function and how it functions. Um, let's look at what those particular policy choices, what that particular universal healthcare approach uh, leads to in comparison to other countries in the OECD. So these are all countries that um, uh, are in the OECD because it provides us with comparable data. And they're all high income countries um, because it's very difficult to compare the outcomes of a, of a high income country with, with a low income country. And they've all made the same decision of, of having the goal of, of um, providing universal coverage for healthcare services to their uh, residents. Um, when we're measuring performance, and this, <clears throat> this really goes much further than what we're talking about right now, it's, it's really important to think about what we're actually measuring. Um, quite often in comparisons, um, a lot of um, discussions end up being completely bogged down by um, focusing on health status indicators. And these are typically things like life expectancy. 
And while that is ultimately uh, the goal of any healthcare uh, system, it is actually a very noisy indicator because indicators of healthcare status are severely impacted also by non-medical determinants of health. So things like life expectancy can be severely in impacted by something like um, uh, environmental factors. They can be impacted by things like genetics. Uh, they can be impacted by the amount of um, gun violence and gun laws in a particular country or traffic laws in a particular country and traffic accidents. So what we're going to try and do over here is really focus on the healthcare system. And I, I will provide some indicators of, of healthcare status as well, but really what I want to do is focus on things that are very directly related to um, the healthcare system. And when we do that, it really comes down to a very simple equation, um, at least from from my, uh, my limited uh, economist point of view, which is how much are we actually putting into the system and what do we actually get in return for it? When we're put in terms of what we're putting in the system, that's very clearly um, healthcare spending and, and looking at indicators of how much money we're spending on these things. And when we talk about what we get in return, we wanna understand is that spending translating into uh, the availability of resources? Is it translating into the volume of services? Is it translating into timely access to care? Um, and or is it translating into quality and clinical performance? In general, we should, if we are spending a certain amount, we should see that money translate at least in one of these areas uh, and hopefully most of them. <clears throat> so let's look at that first side of the equation, how much money we're actually uh, putting into the system. Well, in terms of spending as a percentage of GDP, as we talked about earlier, um, we're spending about, uh, this is slightly old data, so this is in 2018, which is the last uh, comparable um, uh, date uh, that we can look across all these countries. Canada was ranking six out of the 28 countries that we were talking about earlier, um, definitely amongst the top spenders. Uh, when it's spending per capita, uh, we rank a little bit better, but we're still eight out of 28. Um, now, I know there are a lot of you know countries in this graph, and it's probably very hard to read depending on the resolution that uh, that was being um, watched on. But uh, what I've done is I've, I've basically just marked Canada in red and the OECD average in yellow. So those are the two key key bars to look at. Now, what's really interesting with, with, with spending and, and a common criticism is that, well, we can't really just look at spending because countries have a variety of different age demographics. And if you have an older population, well, you're probably gonna have to spend a lot more. And that's why, you know, a country like uh, Germany that has uh, a much older population likely has a higher level of spending. So once we actually adjust for those differences in the ages of the population, actually Canada's ranking goes up even further um, because although Canada does have an aging population, it is actually younger um, than many other countries in the OECD. So Canada ends up ranking second out of 28 in terms of spending as a percentage of GDP uh, and seventh out of 28 in, in terms of spending per capita. Now, we can have a long discussion about which is the best indicator to look at, but I think it's very clear that regardless of which indicator you look at, Canada ranks amongst the top spenders in terms of universal healthcare. And that's fine if, if a country can afford it and if we're getting a good value for that money. So let's look at what the other side of the equation, what do we actually get for that spending um, given the system that we've, we've um, and the policies we've chosen to follow? Well, <clears throat> in terms of availability of resources, things are, really not very good. Um, in terms of physicians per thousand, Canada actually has one of the lowest ratios of physicians per, per, per thousand uh, amongst countries in the OECD, ranking 26th lowest um, out of 28. Um, in terms of nurses, we're a little bit more uh, around the average, 14th out of 28, uh, but definitely nowhere even close to in line with the amount that we're spending. Uh, in terms of uh, things like diagnostic imaging scanners, MRI units per million, um, we're 22nd um, out of 26, again, uh, very much close to the bottom. And in terms of acute care beds, again, very, very much at the bottom uh, with only 2.1 acute care beds per thousand population ranking 25th out of 26. Now, I'm giving you a, a set of chosen indicators. Um, the study that we, that we um, publish every year actually contains 48 different indicators of healthcare. So, Yes, I completely acknowledge there are far more uh, indicators of availability and, and, and the variety of other things with, that we're looking at, but anyone's free to, to go to that, um, that publication and look at the other indicators. I'm really trying to give a representation of what's actually happening 
um, in in those categories. And 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 um, and unfortunately, regardless of which indicator you look at, we do quite poorly when it comes to the availability of resources. Um, the good news is that given those resources, we are using them um, fairly intensively. Um, so we uh, our our utilization in terms of doctor consultations per capita were around average, uh, ranking 10th out of 25th, um, very close to the OECD average over there. Um, but unfortunately, we have very little hospital activity to show for it. Um, in this particular graph, graph we're right at the bottom, um, but I would say that um, that it should be interpreted with a little bit of caution because there are some uh, difficulties in um, what Canada reports for curative care discharges. Um, but have um, very low volume of services compared to other countries. Now, an optimistic view of these two graphs would be that essentially we have a system that's quite good at keeping patients out of hospital. Um, a more realistic view, <clears throat> as we'll see from uh, data on wait times, is that it's really more of a bottleneck where there are a lot of people trying to go and access their family physicians and trying to get treatment uh, but they're facing that bottleneck and aren't actually getting into the hospitals in a lot of cases to get that treatment. So quality, you know, very, very important to look at. Uh, when it comes to things like strokes, we do um, better than average. We're about a ninth out of 27th. Again, I'm trying to give a broad picture of different indicators. Uh, in terms of <clears throat> uh, hemorrhagic uh, strokes were 17th out of 27. Sorry, so the first one was, was uh, acute myocardial infarctions. Um, uh, in terms of strokes, were 17th out of 27, so um, worse than average. Uh, we're very, very good on some things, um, particularly um, uh, cancer survival rates. So there's breast cancer um, five year survival rate, we're ranked um, fifth out of 26. But then we do very poorly on things like obstetric trauma. Um, again, there's some caution to be noted over there, particularly for countries that report well if they don't have good reporting standards. Uh, but there definitely is um, some uh, issue even uh, with that caveat with, uh, with things like obstetric trauma and infant mortality um, in Canada. Um, treatable mortality. So these are kind of those indicators of healthcare status. Um, so treatable mor mortality is really looking rather than a total mortality, it's looking at that mortality, mortality that um, should have been treatable by a healthcare system. We rank essentially around average um, 14th out of 28. And as I mentioned before, with infant mortality, uh, rank very, very poorly. So then we come to, you know, probably the most prominent and, and well-known failure of Canada's healthcare system, which is timely access to care. Um, our cohort of countries over here is smaller because um, there isn't actually good data available across all OECD countries. Um, but there is a wonderful um, survey that is published quite often by the Commonwealth Fund um, based in the United States, um, which looks at, um, at access uh, on a variety of indicators uh, amongst other things. So in terms of the ability to get a same or next day appointment with a doctor or nurse in 2016, only 43% of Canadians were able to do that, ranking right at the bottom. Um, and you can see that that contrasts very um, clearly with countries like the Netherlands, uh, where it was 77% and Australia, where it was 67%. Um, the flip side is true for uh, emergency departments, um, where the largest proportion of Canadians uh, reported uh, waiting four hours of more or more in an emergency department, again, ranking right at the bottom um, with 29%. <clears throat> again, the countries at the top, countries like France, Germany, um, the Netherlands, all actually under 5% uh, compared to Canada's 29%. Uh, waited four weeks or longer to see a specialist. 56% uh, of Canadians waited longer than four weeks to see a specialist in 2016. Uh, compare that to Switzerland and the Netherlands, that's 22 and 23%. Uh, and 18% of Canadians reported waiting four months or longer for elective surgery uh, in 2016. Uh, compare that to the Netherlands and Switzerland, which is four and six, France, 2%, and Germany, no patients having uh, reported waiting as long. Um, so we're very clearly, um, have a serious issue with wait times in Canada. The other takeaway from this, however, is that wait times are not a necessary uh, price to pay for universal healthcare. Very clearly, um, uh, in sorry, in this particular graph, I have I still have the United States uh, included, which is arguably not a uh, not a universal healthcare uh, system at least at, at present. Um, 
But every other country is very clearly a universal healthcare system. Um, and as you can see in countries like Germany and France, Switzerland and Netherlands, um, wait times are not nearly as severe as they are in Canada. So taken all together, um, in terms of spending, Canada is an above average spender on healthcare. Um, we have uh, below average access in terms of um, healthcare resources, utilization and performance is mixed. Um, and wait times are among the worst when we look at developed countries. Let's actually go a little bit more into wait times because I know that that um, takes up a lot of space um, in, in the media and, and, and a lot of time uh, and a lot of concern, uh, particularly when people are thinking about, um, you know, the movements to a purely uh, government um, system and, and potential for rationing over there. So um, when we're actually looking into Canada, one of the things that uh, it's important to actually, when you're looking at any country, um, it's important to really talk about what actually is being measured. Um, now, this, this is an older study it's from about 2013, <clears throat> which shows that when um, governments are measuring wait times, Canadian governments at the time were essentially only measuring uh, the time from when a patient is listed to the time the treatment starts. And that ignores a huge amount of the wait in order to get listed in the first place. Um, and certainly you can actually game how large or small that wait time is <clears throat> depending on what's being measured. Uh, and this was really a struggle that, that I think the Fraser Institute encountered for a long time. In the early 1990s, um, essentially, although there was anecdotal evidence of wait times, um, because something, because wait times weren't being measured, it was essentially being dismissed as something that's non-existent. Um, and that actually, you know, kind of goes back to our motto of um, if if it matters, measure it. And that's precisely what we started doing in the early 1990s. Um, at that time, there was a lot of pushback in terms of, you know, issues with the data. By the mid 2000s, I would say most provincial governments started, you know, conducting their own measurements. Um, but again, those were only looking at the second half of the wait, which is uh, from uh, the time a patient is listed or booked in the hospital to the time. <clears throat> that they actually get treatment and ignoring the way to see a specialist in the first place. Uh, I would say more recently, some provinces have um, started measuring the way to see a specialist in the first place as well. Um, however, those comparisons are still not possible across different provinces because they all measure it in a variety of different ways and for a variety of different treatments. So um, we're still relying on the Fraser Institute's measurements over here. But there are some benefits to doing it, mostly because we've done it with a consistent methodology across the 10 provinces for about 30 years. Um, in 2020, we contacted um, 11,000 physicians. Um, that's the full population of physicians <clears throat> in 12 specialties. And we had responses from about um, 1,200 of them. That's about 11%. Uh, but again, that's not 11% of the sample. That's 11% of the population of physicians. Um, over there, which is why it translates to over a thousand physicians. Um, the overall results of that were that the average Canadian could expect to face a wait of about 22.6 weeks between um, getting a referral from uh, a general practitioner to actually uh, receiving treatment. Um, that's broken down to about 10.5 weeks between a GP to a specialist and about 12.1 weeks uh, from specialist to treatment. Now, one of the fortuitous things about doing this for so long is that we can actually look back with the same methodology um, and look at what um, our measurement was in 1993. And the wait time at that time, which was scandalous in its own way, was actually only 9.3 weeks. Um, and at that time, it was considered a very long wait time. But as we can see, there's been a very steady deterioration of weights over time. <clears throat> now, of course, there is... Um, serious and, and warranted concern that um, 2020 was the year that, that COVID um, hit and, and affected the world and certainly put a lot of strain on the public healthcare system. So one of the things we can do uh, in order to uh, sort of negate that effect is we can also look at um, the wait time that we measured in 2019, where we actually had a high response rate, um, it's about 17% off the population of physicians with about 1,800 physicians responding. Um, and the result over there is actually very similar. Um, it's that the total wait time between uh, GP referral to treatment was 20.9 weeks uh, compared to the 22.6 that we saw in 2020. Um, so yes, you know, likely COVID has had an impact on exacerbating wait times, 
uh, but it's certainly not the cause of the long wait times that you see in Canada, as you can see in this graph. And uh, what it also shows again is the steady deterioration of wait times from the 9.3 weeks that we saw in 1993 <clears throat> to the over 20 weeks that we're now uh, recording on average every year. Um, of course, the wait time does vary according to the specialty. Um, you have considerably longer wait times when it comes to things like um, ophthalmology and orthopedic surgery. We have plastic surgery over here, but this is non-cosmetic plastic surgery. For, so, you know, plastic surgery for things like burn victims or, or something like that. Um, and the wait times over there are about 34 weeks on average uh, for ophthalmology and orthopedic surgery as well. Uh, much shorter wait times <clears throat> for things like radiation and medical oncology, um, where the wait time is about four point, uh, just, just over four weeks. Um, but you also have very long wait times. You know, essentially it's showing you that there is a system of, of triage over here, but you still have very long wait times for, you know, I would say life threatening conditions like uh, neurosurgery treatments where the wait time is 33.2 weeks. Um, and even when we're considering something like orthopedic surgery, even though it's, you know, perhaps not something that will kill somebody if they wait that long, it's not pleasant the individual might be in pain and they likely can't do their job properly if they're waiting for a new hip replacement. So these are things that, you know, are not just benign inconveniences. Um, there are There is huge variation across the provinces as well. Um, much, much longer wait times in what we call um, Atlantic Canada with New Brunswick, Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island. Um, <clears throat> and much shorter wait times in um, the large populous provinces of Ontario and Quebec um, where the wait times about 17 weeks. Um, and it's, you know, only in Canada where a 17 week wait in Ontario would be celebrated as the shortest wait time in the country. I think um, any other country would be quite mortified at, um, at an average wait time that's 17.4 weeks. Um, this, this is a graph that's really looking at the difference between um, the wait time that uh, we have measured and reported um, from specialist to treatment um, and what physicians actually say um, is a clinically reasonable wait time. So the same physicians essentially telling us what they think is reasonable and how long their patients actually ended up having to wait. And you can see that there's a clear difference between um, what physicians consider to be medically reasonable and the actual wait time that their patients waited, um, never mind what um, a patient might actually um, hope to get themselves. Um, and finally, there are also very large wait times for diagnostic medical technology. So the average wait time for ultrasound is about three and a half weeks, um, for CT scans about five and a half weeks, and for an MRI is um, slightly over 11 weeks. Now, this is really important because, um, you know, one can sort of um, rationalize the, the importance of, of triage and, and rationing services um, with limited resources. But if you have a long wait time um, in order to get the diagnosis for the, the, the medical condition itself, in order to understand whether it's urgent or not, that then creates a lot of issues in terms of correctly and appropriately um, triaging patients. Um, of course, wait times do have consequences. One of the, um, I think, most straightforward ones, again, from an economic perspective, is uh, its impact on the economy in terms of lost productivity. Um, our estimate based only on the second half of the wait between specialists to treatment, so not including GP to specialists, is that it cost the economy more than $2 billion, uh, in lost wages and productivity last year. And actually almost, um, I believe it was almost $6 billion when you include evenings and weekends because, well, evenings and weekends have value too, even if they aren't um, necessarily when, when individuals go to work. Um, and of course, there are the traditional uh, medical consequences of long wait times as well. Um, Statistics Canada, um, using their data, we estimate that about 13.2% of patients waiting for non-emergency surgery were affected by, by their weight. Um, you can clearly have instances where uh, a you know, potentially treatable illness can become a permanent disability if the patient waits too long for treatment. Um, and mortality, uh, a, a wonderful study by uh, Second Street, which is the think tank based in Alberta, um, filed a number of freedom of information reports um, over the last two years and found that um, at least uh, 1,500 patients uh, have recorded having died while waiting for their surgery. So very clear consequences of long wait times for care. 
Um, and this brings us to the legality of the situation, because effectively in Canada, you you have no alternative, no recourse um, other than the public um, government monopoly system. Um, and this has led obviously to certain code challenges, um, most notably in 2005, the Shivali case uh, in Quebec um, ruled that the provincial um, ban on private insurance was um, uh, unconstitutional and against the, the Charter of uh, Quebec uh, rights. Um, and very notably, the Chief Justice um, stated clearly that access to a waiting list is not access to healthcare. And I think that's really something um, that, um, that needs to be remembered. Uh, just because something is is promised in name, that doesn't actually mean that it is being delivered. Um, over the last 10 years, we've also had a court case with Dr. Brian Day um, with a number of his patients. Um, the plaintiffs included a teenager who was actually paralyzed after a 27 month wait for treatment. Um, in that ruling, which was at the provincial level, however, the, uh, the judge ruled that while um, the plaintiffs had very clearly demonstrated that um, uh, the, ban, the province's ban on private insurance uh, limited their right to the security um, of the person of the patient. However, the plaintiffs had not demonstrated that this limit on the rights of security of the person of some patients is not in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. It's a, it's a rather perplexing decision because on the one hand, it acknowledges very clearly that these um, provincial bans on private insurance are very much um, harming um, patients. However, in the judge's opinion, they aren't harming them to the extent that it warrants tinkering with the public health care system. Um, obviously, given that perplexing contrast, um, the decision is being appealed to um, the Canadian Supreme Court um, currently. Okay, so that really helps us understand what's going on in Canada. Um, but let's talk about a little bit about um, those other countries with universal health care, the top performers, countries with universal health care that, you know, essentially have similar spending, but generally better performance in terms of the availability of resources and certainly have shorter wait times. Um, in general, there are about six or seven countries that, that we can usually identify that fit into that um, cohort. These are the Netherlands, France, Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, if you'll remember from the previous slides, all of them have much shorter wait times than Canada, not hard to do because Canada is at the bottom of the list um, in terms of wait times for care. Um, but it's a, let's look at how they do universal health care differently compared to Canada. Um, again, they all have universal health care systems. First, they have a very different approach to private insurance. Um, in Canada, as we you know, saw earlier, Canada essentially only allows it for supplementary coverage for things that are not uh, considered to be medically necessary. By contrast, um, <clears throat> in countries like the Netherlands and Switzerland, you have almost entirely private insurance. Essentially, everyone's mandated to buy private insurance in a regulated market. So the government essentially sets the rules of the game. Um, but then within that, there's competition amongst the insurers. Um, there's risk pooling, there's um, measures to make sure that individuals can't be discriminated based on pre-existing conditions, but it is a competitive environment in Switzerland, entirely private, in the Netherlands, private and public. Uh, in Germany, you have more of a substitute uh, system where you can opt out of the public system and get private insurance. Um, and in countries like Australia, you effectively have Canada system, but you also have a parallel track of private insurance uh, which really helps individuals get treatment um, either if the public system cannot um, deliver it in a timely manner um, or and also actually helps relieve some of the burden um, with the public system. Um, I, if I remember correctly, uh, the Australian government actually also incentivized um, its citizens to, to get private insurance because of that potential positive effect um, on the public system. Um, Again, they have a completely different approach to for-profit private hospitals. In Canada, there's only 1% um, that are counted <clears throat> based on those seven hospitals. Uh, meanwhile, in France, you have about 33% of hospitals that are, that are private for-profit. In Germany, it's 43%, Australia, 39%. Uh, the Netherlands number needs to be um, uh, taken with a little bit of a caveat, depending because they have differences based on uh, what they call a hospital or not. Um, in Switzerland, the amount of integration between the public and the private system is you know, so intense and so integral that 
um, there's actually difficulty in, in figuring out the difference between the for-profit hospitals in Switzerland and the not-for-profit private hospitals as well. Um, they have a very different approach to cost sharing. Uh, this one's a little bit of a dated slide. My apologies over there. Um, but essentially, in cost sharing in Canada, as we saw, is effectively prohibited. Meanwhile, in France, these are just some examples. You can have up to 20% um, of the co-payment for inpatient care. In Germany, you have um, you know, just standard amounts for hospital stays. In Switzerland, you have a deductible plus a 10% co-insurance. Um, and in all of these countries, you have uh, annual limits um, to ensure that um, these co-payments do not um, end up becoming a financial burden. So once there's a certain cap that's, leased, uh, that's reached, um, <clears throat> often based on individual's incomes, um, uh, healthcare is, is free at the point of use after that. <clears throat> Finally, uh, when it comes to hospital payment, a completely different um, attitude towards it. Hospital payment is generally um, <clears throat> that's a lot of slides. <laughs> um, hospital payment is is uh, in most countries um, based on activity, whereas um, hospital payment in Canada <clears throat> is based on global budgets. And this is important because when it's based on activity, it actually incentivizes the hospitals to treat patients. Whereas when you have <clears throat> a global budget like you do in Canada, it essentially, you know, unfortunately, um, will treat a patient as a cost eating into that budget. And the reason why we have the global budget, again, is because we have that monopoly over the payment by the government provider. So that's good. We've reached the end of the end of the presentation. Just when my my voice seems to be going a little bit, um, but hopefully that gives everybody a little bit of an understanding about um, Canada's particular and as you've seen unique approach to universal healthcare. Why it looks the way it does, um, how it stacks up <coughs> compared to other countries, and um, its failures in terms of wait times, and importantly, how other countries. Um, pursue universal health care without necessarily having a government monopoly. So that's the end um, of the presentation there. And um, after I have a sip of water, I'm, I'm happy to, to have further discussion, Chris. Thank you, Bacchus. I think I'll try to keep the questions to a minimum. I don't want to keep you <laughs> in pain for too long. Um, I wanted to ask about COVID-19 and the last sort of year you touched on that and how it's important to keep it in, in mind in the context of how the health system in Canada has performed. Are there any lessons that Canada can take from what the pandemic did to the sort of structure of the current healthcare system? Any ways that it could be strengthened or, you know, weaknesses that were really exposed, glaring gaps kind of thing. Um, and then you could also, I guess, a, a second part of, of that question is, you know, in South Africa, there were issues around the procurement of things, for example, such as beds, uh, masks, oxygen, that kind of thing. In the public healthcare sector, a lot, lots of promises, of course, around it was going to be procured very quickly. But just by virtue of the government not being as nimble as the private sector, maybe there were issues around procurement. And if those things also happened um, in Canada. Well, Chris, you know, COVID-19... <clears throat> without a doubt, has severely impacted um, healthcare systems around the world. Mm -hmm. And Canada is no exception to that. Um, Canada took the, the step, like many other countries, to um, cancel and postpone a lot of elective surgeries right. in the country. And that was followed by uh, many other countries, including many of the ones that, um, that I cited. The real difference, however, is the system that people will return to and the sort of excess pressure that is put on top of um, the system that already exists. So in Canada, when um, surgeries were postponed, um, that resulted in thousands of patients waiting on top of the fact that thousands of patients were already waiting for care. That resulted in, you know, as we can see with um, the preliminary data from from our wait time survey, it resulted in a 22.6 wait time, but it's in ex that's in addition to you know what the wait time was earlier. Now, if a country was starting from a different point, 
like um, Germany with their with their much shorter wait time, um, or or Australia with their much shorter wait time. When those cancellations take place, they will have certainly affected wait times in those countries. But that total effect, based on the pressures that they already faced, will be much smaller. And importantly, once they get through this pandemic, they will return to a different system. They will return to a system with significantly shorter waits, whereas Canada will return to a system with very, very large waits. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the good things that's happened during that time, though, um, is that unfortunately, um, due to this intense pressure, it actually resulted in some governments in Canada reaching out to the private sector and learning to partner with them. Now, some of them did it in a more, let's say, free manner, um, and some of them did it in a more limited manner to say, well, you know, we'll, we'll partner with you, but we definitely only want it under our rules and you can't do anything else. Um, and that's what happened in, in a province like BC. But I think it's really opened up the, at least the discussion about the fact that, well, when you have resources on hand, whether they're public or private, use them. Use them to achieve that same universal goal. Um, if patients can be treated by the private sector, help them get treated by the private sector and reduce the strain on the public system. Regarding the procurement of vaccines, uh, did the... Did the Healthcare Act make provision for these sorts of emergency situations? Did the the federal government, you know, decide we're going to buy the vaccines and then distribute them by province or, you know, for example, healthcare workers first priorities, that kind of thing. I um, mean, South Africa, there has been confusion for the last few months. At first, we weren't even sure when we were getting vaccines. There was a lot of pressure mounted on the government to actually tell us where the procurement was, where we're getting them from, how are we paying for them. Uh, we we received a batch of the AstraZeneca vaccine and then that was shown to not be effective against the quote-unquote South African strain. I know it shouldn't be called the South African strain. Then you've got the, 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 the medical a number or name. Uh, and then we had to sort of shelve that and buy new vaccines from Johnson & Johnson. Um, and then eventually the government seemed in court papers to say, at first they said, only the government can procure vaccines, but then in court papers that they gave in, in in a case brought by a civil rights organization, they said, that's not technically what we meant, you know, to paraphrase, uh, private players can procure the vaccine if they so desire, there's not a government monopoly on that. So I'm just wondering about the, the Canadian healthcare system's experience with procuring the vaccines. So um, unfortunately, that's, that's, that's definitely um, outside my area of expertise. Um, <clears throat> what I can say is, I mean, you know, Canada is, it was at the forefront of trying to make um, um, agreements with several vaccine manufacturers um, <clears throat> and has iterative, iteratively taken on um, many of them over time. What's interesting, however, to me, um, or at least from, <clears throat> from the work that I've done, is the re-highlighting of the importance of innovation and the importance of incentivizing innovation when it does happen. So one of the things that we didn't really discuss um, in, in, the, in the presentation was Canada's, <clears throat> sorry, was Canada's approach to, um, to pharmaceuticals and pharmaceutical pricing. So what's happening over the next couple of years is there's actually a massive push to incorporate pharmaceuticals under the same sort of national healthcare plan that we currently have. And at the same time, there's been a huge push from the government to um, figure out ways to drive down the prices for those pharmaceuticals, um, where the public entity will be either the sole or certainly the largest player in the future. Um, <clears throat> and of course, this has consequences. Um, if you don't incentivize innovation, um, and if you don't reward it, um, you might have issues attracting that that innovation in the first place. Um, so I think the importance of innovation was <clears throat> re-highlighted by, um, by the vaccines over here. And I think might give the Canadian government pause to reconsider what it's trying to do by forcing down prices of pharmaceuticals in the future. Regarding um, the numbers of doctors, nurses, specialists, surgeons, that kind of thing, 
have you done any sort of research or polling and you know one one would probably want to do this thing over a certain amount of time you don't want to take over two months and say oh look because of this healthcare system all the doctors have left canada kind of thing you need to see if there are trends over time is there anything about canada's healthcare system and research that you've done that could indicate that the way it's approached healthcare has driven people to not pursue working in healthcare we're worried in south africa especially around incentives sort of touching on what you mentioned earlier and just you know if you get involved in the south african public healthcare sector what the government might expect of you where they might send you to work um will you be adequately paid and then we find people being driven overseas so they go to the uk they go to canada to new zealand and south africa i think has a, has a serious short shortage um, there's also part of regulations and licensing that just makes it difficult to sort of get your your you know your license to work in in a particular area of healthcare. But I'm just wondering if there are any trends like that in Canada. Yeah, um, <clears throat> there's a very long story with physicians over here that that I won't, I won't get into too much. Um, <clears throat> essentially, Canada did have a high supply of physicians still about the early '80s. Um, and then due actually to government intervention, um, <clears throat> the supply was, I think um, the policies were to reduce the training of physicians by about 10% um, and, uh, and the postdoctoral trainings of uh, physicians by 10% as well. And essentially <clears throat> kind of the physician to population ratio then plateaued in the 1990s. Meanwhile, in all other countries, the physician to population ratio um, increased as it would um, <clears throat> over time. And Canada's government realized around, I would say probably the early 2000s that it had probably made a mistake <clears throat> and started to reverse that, try and train more physicians. Um, but of course it takes about 10 years um, <clears throat> in order to get a physician trained. Now, the really unfortunate thing is that when those physicians started to graduate, there was a study in 2012 that showed that about 16% of them couldn't get um, employed. So that leads back to the, um, the global budgeting approach that's there in Canada, where even if you have a physician, if there aren't enough funds for the physician to perform surgeries in those public hospitals, they're not gonna get employed in the first place. Seeing as you're an expert on Canadian healthcare, I'm going to ask you to be an expert on South African healthcare. So one of the, I guess, the tools or proposals that we at the FMF um, have been exp uh, expounding for years is the idea of healthcare vouchers. And for people who, who don't have the disposable income to be part of a medical aid or to afford going to private healthcare services, which we think compared to the world average are quite good in South Africa, the, the healthcare um, quality that you can get in the private sector is quite good. But for people who can't afford it, if the government, if the government wants to be involved in healthcare, at least give vouchers so then people can choose where they use them, kind of thing. You don't then force everyone to go to government healthcare facilities, which have generally been on the decline. Do you think that sort of thing is a is a good idea? What weaknesses do you see with that sort of plan? Um, South Africa, we have serious fiscal constraints uh, because the government has spent money on things like South African Airways. Uh, SOEs which have failed time after time when they should have probably probably been focusing on basic service delivery for the poor for people who can't afford the kind of thing so work on improving those healthcare facilities for poor people who can't afford to go to um, sort of expensive private facilities yeah you know I'm definitely not an expert on on South African affairs um, a voucher system is something that has been uh, talked about many times particularly in the education sector I've, I've you know, the evidence suggests that it works. I think <clears throat> from my perspective, it's more about um, the government's attitude towards using um, the best resources at its disposal, whether it's public or private, in order right. to achieve the same goal. Um, in Switzerland, um, that's a very interesting example. So in Switzerland, uh, essentially you have a 100% private insurance. Um, and individuals who uh, can't afford the insurance are subsidized in order to get whatever private insurance they choose. So it's not a voucher system per se, but it's a, it's, it's, it's a different way of thinking about it. It's essentially saying, look, 
we understand the importance of competitive markets. At the same time, we understand the importance of uh, protecting and ensuring that everyone gets access to these um, these services um, with choice. And rather than saying that <clears throat> individuals who can't afford something shall be relegated to a public sector, they still give them the same choice to get it from the same sort of insurers that um, <clears throat> that their wealthier counterparts can afford. Um, in Australia, you have the same sort of thing where the government um, incentivizes and subsidizes um, <clears throat> the procurement of private insurance. Uh, and in most countries, really, I think the attitude should be <clears throat> use the best resources at your disposal. The final question I had for you was around um, something that you highlighted early on in your presentation, just around uh, how provinces, I, I, you know, put put words in your mouth, but uh, sort of get away with the vagueness of the the laws and what they should provide and not provide. And this is sort of the rule of law idea, where you, with the rule of law and it, it underpinning all your laws in a country, you want laws and powers given to ministers or departments or provinces to be as as sort of black and white as possible so that it can't be misinterpreted for someone else's gain that a minister can't, for example, use it to their benefit, but not to an average citizen. Um, so you want the law to be as clear as possible. So in that vein, you know, I'm not, I'm not presuming that you're a rule of law expert, but legality constitutions, that kind of thing, how do you think that can be improved and better refined? And then maybe in South Africa, if we do the national health insurance and we have a bill and a law coming into sort of um, coming into force. How can one make it as uh, as easy as possible for the government to follow what it promises? You know, as you said, one can promise these things. You can have these lofty ideals, but that doesn't mean you get to deliver it. You can spend as much as you want. Doesn't mean services are actually improved. So, how does one, you know, to to help government in a way? And of course, libertarians, you know, people are going to say, why should we help the government do anything? But if we're going to have the system, how do you make it for them as easy as possible to sort of deliver on what they've talked about? That's really important. Um, I think one of the greatest enemies of progress and innovation is um, uncertainty with mm -hmm. regards to the rule of law. Um, if there is uncertainty um, and there is um, a threat of um, financial or, or legal action, um, there will be essentially a risk-averse environment that has been created um, in that circumstance. So even if <clears throat> it might look worse on paper, um, if you have specific laws that are talking about what is and isn't allowed, <clears throat> I think it creates very clear rules of the game. Um, and opens clear areas where, um, where the other um, innovative um, uh, institutions, where, where um, players who are trying to figure out what policy that's currently not being pursued uh, can be pursued in order to get a better outcome, where they can experiment with it. Um, and if it doesn't work, it's fine. You still have the same system, but I think clarity in, in terms of what is allowed and isn't allowed will help um, people say, okay, let's leave that out of the way. Let's look at the things that we can actually improve on and let's work on that because it's very clear that this is now our space. So um, of course, ideally, um, I would hope that there's more partnership um, in terms of, again, using the best resources at your disposal. Um, but at the very least, there should be clarity in terms of um, what is and what isn't uh, permitted in, in, in these circumstances. The sort of vagueness of laws is something that I think South Africa has been contending with in a, for a while. And I think it has contributed to the endemic corruption that we've seen in all sorts of sectors and parts of life. It just, it's sort of a context of government powers being vague and it's to the benefit of unscrupulous actors and it's not just an indication of the current regime i think if any that's sort of the nature of state power i suppose if one um, doesn't define clearly the parameters it doesn't matter who occupies the office it's an incentive for for them to use it to their own benefit i think um 
But yeah, I think on that note, um, I mean, you've got a, a day ahead of you. It, we're recording this in the evening. You've got a day of work of head, ahead of you. So I'm going to let you go so you can you can recover your voice after that marathon uh, presentation. But we have to thank you for your time, for your expertise and for your insta- insights today. I've really enjoyed it and found it useful. And I'm sure the viewers and listeners will have as well. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Chris. And, and good luck with... Um with uh, the process ahead and hopefully um, people understand that all parties should be invited to the table to talk about these things Um, and we have a wealth of evidence from around the world to look at and implement the best policies that will serve the population in the future viewers and listeners as always thank you for joining us Uh, we really appreciate your support we've been growing the channel quite a lot in the last few months and that wouldn't happen without all of you engaging on our videos, liking them, sharing them. And uh, on that note, remember to like and share this particular video on your different social media channels. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to our channel for more content like this in coming months. Uh, Next week, Tuesday on the 9th of March, I'll be talking to economist Mike Schussler about the state of South Africa's finances, where we are currently with government spending and that kind of thing. And that'll be live at 11 a.m. So make sure that you uh, subscribe to our channel and set a reminder to watch that episode live. Um, Please go to our website, www.freemarketfoundation.com to find all our articles and press releases and research. You'll find a lot of wealth of information there. And on that note, I will also link to the Fraser Institute in the description below so you guys can find out a lot of their work. I would obviously want to highlight the Economic Freedom of the World Report. That's a wealth of information on its own. And it'll be useful for any of you who want to investigate the I guess you want to call it the ingredients that are essential for a prosperous society and where, in what direction South Africa should be going. We talk about structural reform. Well, what kind of reforms do we need? We shouldn't just have reform bandied about as an empty term. I hope all of you have a good day ahead uh, whenever you're listening to this uh, episode. We thank you again for your time. And for now, we'll say take care and goodbye. <laughs>